All right, everyone. Welcome to our third lecture for Computer Science E1. Uh, so this week and next week, we're going to start transitioning away from hardware. So for the first two weeks of the course, uh, we kind of took a look at how the energy of your computer worked and things like the BIOS and the hard drive, um, and how, as you're browsing the web and other activities, what's actually going on under the hood of your computer. So now we're going to start to kind of take a step up from hardware. So we're just kind of start to take for granted that things like your processor work, and we don't need to worry about how instructions are flowing through the CPU, for example. Now we're going to start taking a look at some higher level concepts, starting with networking. Um, so today we're going to go over some basically networking foundations, um, so things uh, like IP addresses and domains and how all of those work. And then next week, we're going to kind of build on top of that and take a look at protocols like HTTP and TCP. So that's kind of where we're headed over the next few weeks. So uh, last time, uh, I just wanted to show this video that we didn't actually get a chance to show. All right. So this week, um, we're actually starting a cool new thing with sections in which now Ben and RJ, um, every couple of weeks, are going to start discussing some cool things that you brought up on Discuss. Um, so there was some discussion on the discussion board about uh, SSEs and HDDs. And so this week, uh, we actually have a section video um, which both Ben and RJ are going to talk about the trade-offs um, with SSDs and HDDs. And so we mentioned, uh, for example, that SSDs have the advantage of being faster than HDDs. And that, you know, it's kind of nice, like, you know, faster, what does that really mean? Um, so this is actually just a quick video uh, to illustrate what we mean uh, when we say that these things are faster. So what's going to happen here, as, as will be explained, is the computer on the left has an, eight, has an SSD, and the computer on the right has an HDD. Other than that, these two computers are totally identical. So same amount of RAM, same CPU, um, so no megahertz myth or anything here. The only thing different is just the hard drive. And so here's what's going to happen uh, when he turns them on at the same time. We're going to do a boot up test. And we know that the hard drive version on the left boots up in around 50 seconds. So we're going to see how much faster the one on the right will boot up compared to that. So, boom. Okay, so obviously there's quite a big speed difference already. And about 20 seconds in, we've already fully booted up the solid state drive version. And it looks like the hard drive version is still got quite a bit of ways to go. All right. So that's what we mean when we say that an SSD is faster. So these two things were completing the same exact task, basically uh, loading the operating system. So going to disk, loading up all the operating system code, and loading it into memory. And it's much, much faster to do that on an SSD, because we can access all of the stuff that's stored on the hard drive much, much faster. Um, so that was that video. Um, so on the syllabus, uh, we actually have uh, our first exam coming up. Um, so not next week, but the week after. We'll have an exam in class, and we'll have uh, more details about that uh, to follow. But next week, after lecture, there's going to be a review session uh, led by Ben and RJ, where they'll recap basically the first four lectures, and you'll have the opportunity to ask them any questions um, in person, as well as ask some questions online uh, on Discuss. We'll get back to you as soon as we can. Um, so just that'll happen next week after lecture. OK, so I wanted to start off our discussion of the internet with this video from The Onion. And so this is kind of uh, poking fun at some of the buzzwords that arise around the internet and networking these days. Uh, so in particular, a lot of people talk about this thing, the cloud, without really knowing what it means. And so one of the goals of these next two weeks is to kind of unwrap what it means, uh, what these buzzwords like cloud mean. When someone says that I'm cloud computing or backing up to the cloud, uh, what that actually means. So here's just a spoof of what it doesn't mean. Hewlett Packard is known for their basic, affordable, no-frills computers. But that doesn't mean they can't keep up with the latest technology. In a press release yesterday, HP said, quote, We are excited to begin offering that cloud thing that everyone is talking about. We definitely have the cloud on our computers, and it is better than anyone else's cloud. Earlier today, I sat down with HP spokesman Gary Klinman, who said the company couldn't wait to show people, quote, how they do their cloud stuff. We are absolutely thrilled that uh, now uh, people with computers or, or, or phones, both, both, uh, will now be able to... Um, uh, back things up to the cloud. And yes, and that is definitely, uh, that's definitely something that people do, and they will be doing it with HP. HP is making their cloud technology the centerpiece of a major new print and television ad campaign. HP is the company I've always relied on. 
So when I decided to get on my computer on the cloud, which is how you do it, naturally HP was the company I chose. HP's cloud is the perfect tool for emails, Facebooks, texting, and CD-ROMs. How does the cloud work? It's so simple and intuitive, I don't need to waste your time explaining it. Clinton says it isn't surprising they're, quote, up on the cloud, considering they're on the cutting edge of all the latest tech trends. Now, are there any additional features? Crowdsourcing is something we are having. Crowdsourcing 2.0. We have uh, uh, social sharing. We have uh, 4G, 5G, 6G, really all the Gs. We have app. We have all of it in the computer. Despite all of their wide array of technology, HP says they're most excited about the cloud. They even let me take a peek at their design laboratory, where HP engineers were trying out some unique development techniques. So, how much capacity will HP's cloud users have access to? 1,000. We'll be watching to see if HP's cloud push pays off. Make sure to catch the next tech trends when we'll be looking at BodyDo, the popular new device that links with your iPhone to post all of your bodily functions right to Facebook. All right. So now, um, the, over these couple weeks now, we're going to start to actually understand uh, what's going on underneath the hood when we talk about things like the cloud. Um, so let's start off with a demo. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a command here. It's going to make a request to CNN.com. What it's going to do is just kind of output what happened along the way when I made that request to CNN.com. So here I've opened up a terminal. And a terminal is simply a, a different way to launch programs. So here, rather than clicking on an icon on my desktop, I'm actually just going to type something in and hit Enter. And it's going to run some program. So much like you know, clicking on the Google Chrome icon will run Chrome, I'm actually just going to type in the name of the program that I want to run, and it's going to run. So I'm actually on a server here. Uh, this is something, a server that I own. It happens to be located in New Jersey because I'm renting it from some other country. And so this is what happens when I make a request from New Jersey to CNN.com. So we're kind of hanging down here. So we can see basically that along the way, we basically made a bunch of little stops. So down here we have these stars, and these are basically because these, these stops on the way to CNN.com, these computers are kind of choosing not to identify themselves for one reason or another. But we can basically get the gist of what happened. So here, this first line happens to be my computer. So this is where the request started. And then the request to CNN.com, it looks like it didn't go directly to CNN.com. It looks like it hit upwards of 30 other things or so on the way there. So does anyone happen to know what each of these rows is? So this looks like something here. Then I'm hitting something like VLAN, TBR, MMU. Does anyone happen to know what each of these rows represents? Location. Yeah, so it's a location. So what, what, is actually, what is the actual physical thing at that location? Does anyone happen to know what it's called? Yeah, so these things have IP addresses, and that's what's over here. So this happens to be the IP address of my server that's located in New Jersey. But each of these rows here represents what's called a router. So each router then has this thing called an IP address, which just seems to be some way of uniquely identify it. And so it seems like when I made a request to CNN.com, it didn't go straight to CNN.com. And that probably makes sense, because my laptop in New Jersey isn't directly connected to whatever machine is powering CNN.com. So it kind of needs to make a few stops on the way. So much like you know, you're, if you're taking a long flight you know, across the country or around the world, you don't usually have a direct connection. You might have a few layovers on the way there, some stops over this long connection. So each of these rows is kind of like a layover on the way to CNN.com. So just reading it into this a little bit, uh, we can see here, starting on row 5, this identifier for one of these routers has the word Newark. And that makes sense because I said that my server is in New Jersey. So this looks like this router is located in Newark. So if we start to kind of trace where this request is going, it looks like we start in New Jersey, go to the Newark, then suddenly we're in Washington, then we're down here in Atlanta, <laughs> and we end up kind of somewhere near Atlanta before these routers stop identifying themselves. So there's a good chance that CNN.com is actually hosted somewhere in Georgia. So up here, these things before Atlanta, these are actually very commonly airport abbreviations. Um, so some small airports in Washington or Georgia uh, probably have these abbreviations. And basically, you know, these, these lines 
that these connections from my computer to this router that's connected to another router kind of follows the same path that your plane might uh, as you're traveling from here to Georgia. So let's switch back. So what I just did when I typed in traceroute cnn.com is I made a request to something at cnn.com. And this is the same way that if I opened up a web browser and typed cnn.com, I'd still need to make some request to cnn.com. And I'm basically asking CNN.com for some information. Uh, the information at CNN.com happens to be today's news, probably. And so what that is, means that CNN is serving me some news. So we call this machine powering CNN.com a server. So a server is basically just a computer whose job in life is to serve other computers some information. So in this scenario, when I'm requesting information from the CNN server, I am called the client because I am asking a server for some information. And so that's some terminology you may have heard before. If you know, I'm on a, what's, someone has asked you, what's your web client, or you're asking for a, a web server somewhere. So that's where that terminology comes from. So a server is really, the only role of a server is it's just a fancy computer whose job is to serve up some content. So as we said, on the way, we hit some routers. So my computer happens to be on the Harvard Wi-Fi right now. So the Harvard Wi-Fi is this large network, but it's not directly connected to CNN.com. Right? The only way for that to happen is for a wire to be physically running from here all the way to Georgia, which probably wouldn't make so much sense. So instead, each of these routers is effectively establishing some path along these little layovers that get me from New Jersey or from here all the way to CNN.com. And so this is kind of what the internet is, right? I'm not directly connected to every other machine on the internet, but I'm connected to some routers that are connected to some other routers that will eventually be connected to the server or the other machine that I'm making a request to. So if we come back to this output here, we can also see not only not only uh, what router it is, we can see a number that uniquely identifies it and also the time it took me to get there. So we can see that it only took about 20 milliseconds, my request to travel all the way from New Jersey to Georgia, which is pretty cool. So we're talking about uh, some pretty fast speeds here. So the internet really then is just this large network, where a network is defined as a bunch of connected computers. So when I have two connected computers, that means that they can communicate with each other. So a really simple network might look something like this. So I just have a computer on the left, and maybe there's a wire running from the computer on the left to the computer on the right. And the computer on the right has a wire running from, the, from that computer to the one on the left. And so now, because these two computers are somehow physically connected, that means they can start to talk to each other. So this is nice, you know, connecting things like this. But once we start introducing more computers into the equation, things start to get a little messy. So now if you want to have four computers, you had to have all these crazy wires um, connecting them. And so this is still a network. We have these four connected computers. But it looks kind of messy, because we have all these wires going everywhere. So instead, you might want to utilize a device called a router. So what a router does is it kind of serves as a communication hub for the network. So now I have four computers. And rather than you know, upwards of 16 wires, I now have only four wires, one connected, each one connected from a computer to a router. So now, if the computer all the way on the left wants to communicate with the computer all the way on the right, it's going to send a message to the router and say, I would like to communicate with the computer on the right. The router's going to say, OK, well, I know that you're not connected there, but I'm connected to that computer. So I'm going to forward your request along all the way to the computer on the right. So now we've basically created a very small network where all of these computers can make requests to each other and communicate. So any questions on networks? OK, so we have a small network here. But what this doesn't have yet is an internet connection. Right? These four computers can talk to each other, but they still can't really talk to CNN.com. Right? If we just have this little isolated bubble in which these are the only connections, unless one of these computers is powering CNN.com, there's no way for me to connect to the internet. So to do that, I'm going to need the help of someone called an internet service provider, or ISP. So you've probably heard of ISPs like Comcast or Verizon. And basically, the ISP serves as a link from your computer or your home network to the big internet, where all of the other networks are connected to. So your home setup might look something like this. So on the left, we have a diagram that's pretty much the diagram we just saw. We have any number of computers connected to some router. So this is kind of the communication hub. 
So now all of these computers are connected to the router. Now we're going to connect the router to our modem. The modem is the small device um, that may or may not also be a router, depending on what modem you buy. Um, but in this case, let's just say they're two separate things. And the motor was given to you, modem was given to you or set up for you by the likes of Comcast or Verizon. And this is what's actually going to connect to some uh, coaxial cable jack uh, inside of your house. And so that'll run down the equivalent of phone lines and actually connect you to the internet. And so that service that's, that's connecting your home network to the larger internet is provided by your ISP. So just having a wireless router at your home is not enough to get you on the internet. It'll start allowing you to communicate with other computers on the same network. But once you introduce the ISP, who gives you a modem, you can hook up to your individual computers or a router. Then that's what allows you to connect to the internet. So we have a couple terms uh, for the different networks. So this small network at my home, or maybe the network at the company that you work off, uh, might be called a LAN or a local area network. And so a LAN is basically a small network that creates uh, a network over a small geographic region. Right? So we're talking the size of a house or maybe the size of a building. So very local. So if all of these computers are directly connected on this network, that means they can communicate with each other no problem. So if we start connecting LANs together, we get what's called a WAN or a wide area network. So if I have a LAN at my house and that my neighbors also have a LAN, and suddenly we get connected together because we're, part, we're both subscribing to the same ISP, we now have a WAN. And that's going to start spanning the areas of cities or different metropoli. And so once we start connecting all of those together, we get the internet. And so the internet then is really just a big network of networks. So a LAN is a very small network at my house, and I'm connected to some other LANs. And some of those LANs happen to be the ones powering CNN.com and some other websites. So because I can connect my network to someone else's network who's connected to CNN's network, that means that I can start communicating across networks to get the information that I'm looking for. So this is what we mean when we uh, say the word internet. So originally it was an internetwork because you're communicating across networks. So does that make sense? That terminology makes sense? Any questions there? OK. So this is what a WAN could look like. So at the bottom here, I have some LAN. It's connected to a router. And that router is connected to another router, which happens to be another network. And so now these bottom computers can communicate with these top computers. And if I ran traceroute, for example, on one of these bottom computers to the top one, we'd probably see a row for the first router. Then we see another row for that second router, that other stop. And then we'd finally reach our destination. So let's try running traceroute on another site. So let's actually try. For example, bbc.co.uk. So I'm going to run this. So we see this one's a little bit shorter, but that means we just hit fewer routers along the way. So our first row looks exactly the same, because we're still starting off at this same machine. And so does anyone notice any uh, big differences between any two of these rows? So this third column is the uh, fourth column is the time, remember? So does anyone notice any big differences in the time? Yeah, five yeah, so between 5 and 6. So here we have this thing here, this TBR, which happens to be an airport, uh, Washington, I think, or somewhere around there. And so now we go from here to this router here, which is identifying itself as BBC has, and now code.uk. And so we've gone from 1 millisecond to 72 milliseconds there. So in terms of, what's geogra like terms of geography, what actually just happened? Yeah, so we just crossed the Atlantic Ocean. Right? So that means that there's a wire running somewhere from some router on the East Coast to another router in the UK. And so it's actually going to take some time for us to actually cross the Atlantic Ocean. And so that's where that time delay is actually introduced. So that means that if I'm in the US and I'm making a request to some other server that's on the other side of the world, it is actually you know, going to be slower, which makes sense, because our request actually needs to travel that far. So now let's take a look at this third column here. So we mentioned that this is called an IP address. So an IP address is simply a way of uniquely identifying a device on the internet. And that uniquely is a bit of a white lie, and we'll see why later. But for right now, 
An IP address is just like your home address. So you need some way of identifying where you live. And if someone else has the same address as you, that's a problem, because then you don't know which place the letter should be sent to, for example. So now these need to be unique. So we can see here that these IP addresses look something like this. So this happened to be my IP address at the time, 10.251.202.239. So IP addresses will always be in this form here. There'll be four um, sets of digits. And each of those digits is going to range from 0 to 255. So actually, how many bits is that? So if I'm talking from 0 to 255, Yeah, so this is going to be 8 bits. So that means if each of these things is 8 bits, and there are 4 of them, then how many bits total is this IP address? 32 bits, exactly. So that means that if each of the, the IP address in total is 32 bits large, that means that there has to be some upper limit on the number of IP addresses, right? Because we can't just keep tacking on more and more digits. So the upper limit on the number of these IP addresses is actually this number here, so 4 billion-ish. And so that, at first glance, that's a pretty huge number, right? We have 4 billion IP addresses. But then you kind of start to think, and the world's population is 6 or 7 billion, so that's already more the number of IP addresses. And I, for example, on this podium have two laptops, two iPads, and an iPod, so that's five IP addresses there. And that's probably not too uncommon, right? You might have a computer at home, a computer at work, a smartphone, and each of these things needs an IP address if it's going to be able to be contacted on a network. So really, this number actually isn't so large. So when the internet was first started out, um, the engineers designing the internet probably weren't thinking about supporting upwards of 6 billion people on the same network. And so this actually was just kind of a short-sighted decision that was made. That at the time, 4 billion was like, nah, we're never going to hit that. It's totally fine. We'll just make IP addresses that large. And now, actually, today, we're starting to run out of these IP addresses because we have so many. And in fact, we already have run out. So this isn't the first time um, that kind of a short-sighted quote uh, was made like this. So this is a quote from Bill Gates um, back in the 80s when he's saying uh, that the, an IBM machine at the time had this limitation where it could support about 640 kilobytes of RAM. And he was, people were saying, well, that's probably not so good. And, uh, Bill Gates is rumored, uh, he denies it now, but is rumored to be quoted as saying that 640k kilobytes of memory ought to be enough for anybody. So. Not the first time uh, that we've made this kind of short-sighted decision. So these addresses here are called IPv4. So this is version 4 of the internet protocol, which we'll see next week, actually. So now there's actually a movement that's developing a new way of addressing computers on the internet. So right now, IPv4 is still widely used. And if you connect to, an inter if you connect to a network, you'll be able to see your computer's IP address. When we say IP address, we're probably just referring to IPv4. But now we're actually starting to develop this other thing called IPv6. And IPv6 is basically just a bigger IP address. So IPv6 addresses, rather than that 1.2.3.4, which is kind of nice and easy to read, IP addresses look something like that. So now, rather than allowing just for 8 bits each, IP addre IPv6 addresses are actually much, much larger. So IPv6 addresses are actually 128 bits, uh, which is much larger uh, than just the 32. And that means that the total number of IPv6 addresses is that, which is a significantly larger number uh, than 4 billion. And there's actually a website dedicated to letting you know how many IPv6 addresses are left. So there are currently that many IPv6 addresses, and we're projected to run out in that year. Five something <laughs> AD. So again, it, I think it's kind of funny that we may, we may look at this now and be like, that's, that's not even a year as far as we're really concerned. Um, but the people designing the original internet may have looked at that number 4 billion and said, that's completely insane. Like, we'll just never hit that. So it's, it's super, super interesting to see, you know, this is kind of our, our short-term solution, because we're really, it's really not much of a long-term solution just making the thing bigger. So we're probably just going to have to make the thing bigger. Uh, down the road. It's just kind of interesting to think about you know, what, what's going to happen even farther down the road if we ever somehow use up all of these IP addresses. So there's an event recently, uh, the IPv6 World Launch Day. And basically, we're 
an organization was trying to get companies like Google and Facebook and CNN to switch all of their infrastructure from IPv4 to IPv6. Because eventually, you know, if it's true that, we're running, that we've run out of IPv4 addresses, and that's a big deal because we can't uniquely identify things on the internet anymore. So we need to start actually switching to this new IP address system. That's going to require kind of reconfiguring all of the servers behind Google and Facebook. And so this uh, was the second annual event in which uh, this organization tried to get people to switch over. Uh, the slogan this year was, this time it's for real, uh, since last time it, it wasn't really for real. <laughs> and so these are kind of some of the organizations involved. Well, we need the cooperation of people like ISPs, like Comcast, so that when you connect to their network, you actually are able to get an IPv6 address and use it. I mean, then we also need um, other people like Microsoft and Google to allow their servers to be addressed with IPv6 addresses so that you can kind of share on um, the same way of communicating with each other. So you can read uh, more about the event on worldipv6launch.org. Uh, and if you're curious how successful it was, this is kind of what the IPv6 adoption is concerned, uh, looks like, uh, determined by Google. And so this looks really nice until you kind of zoom in on the scale here and they're kind of 1%. And so this is saying that about, right now, about 1% of the requests that come into google.com are actually using IPv6. So that's nice. That means that Google actually supports IPv6. And if you're using it, then you'll be able to talk to Google. But while these actual numbers on the right-hand side aren't too impressive, what is kind of impressive is this growth here. So this curve is starting to kind of skyrocket upwards. So this is kind of good news in terms of the adoption of IPv6. If this curve keeps kind of skyrocketing upwards, that means it won't be too long until a majority of the requests on the internet, or at least to Google, are actually using IPv6, which means that we're kind of moving towards adoption. We're going to kind of hit this tipping point pretty soon if this curve keeps going upward like this. So any questions on IP addresses? So again, oh yeah, sure. Sure, yeah, we'll actually see that in just a moment, how we actually get assigned an IP address. So remember, an IP address then is just this way of uniquely identifying a computer. Because if I have two computers on the internet and I want to talk to one, I need some way of saying, I want to talk to that computer and tell the network, this is where I want to talk to. So we need to give that some address. Just like we gave, for example, addresses in RAM, these unique numbers just from 0 to something like 2 to the 32, or depending on how much RAM you had. Now we're simply giving them a different way, a different address. But again, they're really just numbers. So another way, another way of kind of getting around this problem of having too many IP addresses are these things called private IP addresses. So when we said that an IP address uniquely identifies a computer on the internet, that was a little bit of a white lie, because you actually don't need a unique IP address to communicate over the entire internet. If that were the case, then we'd actually start running into some problems. But the reason that we're still OK using IPv4 is because these, this address doesn't actually need to be unique over the entire internet. So reason being, if I have a computer at home and some website, you know, that a computer at home, for example, is not going to power CNN.com. So I don't need to have the entire world be able to talk directly to my computer. Instead, what I can give my computer is something called a private IP address. So a private IP address is still this address, but it's no longer unique over the entire network, of the entire internet. It's now unique only within my small network. So that means that I may have a computer on my home network with an IP address like 10.0.0.1, but when I go to work, I'm on a different network, my computer might also have an IP, the IP address 10.0.0.1. So how does that work, right? That means how can I actually make a request to google.com and then have Google respond to me, right? Because in order for Google to respond to me, it somehow needs to send back some information, which means that it needs to send information again to some kind of IP address. And so if my IP address is no longer unique to the whole internet, this doesn't really make sense without some kind of middleman here. So first, uh, let's just define what we mean by an IP address. So we, these three prefixes here are the common prefixes for an IP, a private IP address. So if you see something like 10 dot something dot something dot something, that's probably an IP address and a private IP address. So similarly, if you see 192.168.y.z, um, that's also 
a private IP address. And so when we were allocating, as we'll see in a moment, as we were allocating all the IP addresses available in the internet to different geographic regions, we basically said, OK, nobody is going to get IP addresses that start with either 10.172.16 or 192.168 because we're going to reserve these for this private IP address thing. So that simply means, again, that if my computer has a private IP address, it's not unique over the entire internet. And a computer on another network cannot simply use my private IP address to communicate with me. So the way that we can use private IP addresses to connect with the internet is this thing called NAT, where NAT stands for uh, Network Address Translation. And so what this allows us to do is actually change what my request looks like when it's coming from a private IP. So let's say that I'm on my home network, for example, and it looks something like this. So my router has an IP address. And this is going to be a public IP address that's unique to the entire internet, let's say. So I'm just going to say that my router's IP address is 74.125.26.228. I just totally made that up. It's just a random IP address. So now I have three devices connected to my home network. I have, I'm an Apple fanboy, so I have a MacBook, I have an iPhone, I have an iPad, and I probably have some more Apple devices because I really like them. And each of these devices now does not have a public IP address. Instead, they all have private IP addresses. So I could have 10.0.0.1.2.3. Because this starts with 10 dot something, I know that this address is a private IP address. So all of these things are now connected to the router. And the router now is going to keep track of everything that's currently connected to it. So my Wi-Fi router that's probably sitting on my computer knows what's connected to it. And it's going to assign everything connected to it this unique number. So for example, the, my MacBook happened to get the identifier 1000. And that's simply going to be some way of uniquely identifying my MacBook from my router. We're going to call this a source port. And we'll see where things like source and later destination ports come in next week. But right now, this is simply a way of identifying my router being able to say that 10.0.1 is this unique thing. OK, so let's actually trace a request now. So I'm on my MacBook. I have a private IP. And I'm going to make a request to something like CNN.com. We know that CNN.com has to have a public IP address, right? else there'd be no way for me to get there if it's on a different network. So CNN.com has a public IP address. And this is what's going to happen. So my request is going to go from my computer. As we saw, the first place it's going to stop is the router. So it's going to stop at the router. And the router is going to say, OK, I have a request coming in from 10.0.0.1. The router is going to ask, what is the source port for that private IP address? So it's going to look inside of this table that's just stored on the router. And it's going to look up this source port for this IP address. And so that's why, for example, private IPs have to be unique within this network, but not within the larger internet. Because if we had two private IPs that were the same in this network, the router would have no way of saying, what's the source port for this IP? So OK, so we're just looking up this unique number uh, that the router is going to somehow need to use. So this is where the magic happens. After we look up this number, the router is actually going to change this request. So when I made this request, it said, I am coming from the IP 10.0.0.1, and I don't even know what a source port is, so whatever. Once it gets to the router, the router is going to say, OK, actually, this request is coming from my IP, which is public, which is 74.125.26.228. So the router is actually going to modify the request that I made from my computer. It's going to wipe out where it's coming from and replace it with this public IP. That is simply the router's IP. And it's also going to tack on this source port. So now the request that was made from 10.0.0.1 is now made from 74.something with this additional identifier. So now we're going to send along my request, and eventually it's going to reach its destination. So CNN.com now sees a request not coming from 10.0.0.1, but coming from 74.something, which is simply a public IP address. And CNN.com has no idea what device that this IP address is. It doesn't know if it's my iPhone, if it's my router, and it doesn't really care. It just needs to know where it should send the response to my, client, to my client's request. So let's see what happens. 
So now, CNN.com receives this uh, request to this address, and it's going to forward it to some routers. And again, it's going to respond to the router's IP address. And again, it's going to make its way through the internet, kind of have some layovers on the way to its flight back to my house. And it's going to eventually reach the router at my house, because that had a public IP address. So now the router sees a request coming in, and it's going to this IP, IP address, 741256.228. And the router knows, well, that doesn't really matter, because I changed the request, and I actually forged it. Right? I'm lying. It's not actually going there. But we did send back this source port again, because CNN.com sent back the same thing that I sent to it. So it's going to say, OK, forget that IP address. I know I have this unique number. I'm going to go back in to this table and use the source port to get an IP address. So if we back up, we're back at this table. Now the router is going to say, OK, well, I know the source port has to be 1,000. What is the private IP that corresponds to that? It's going to be 10.0.0.1. So now the router knows where this request is actually going. It's not going to 74 dot something. It's really going to 10 dot something. So now the router can actually modify the request again and send it back to the original client that made the request. So now the, my, my request from 10 dot o dot something went all the way to CNN.com, back to my router, and back to my private IP address. So that means that using this technique here, this technology, I was able to communicate with a public IP address without me myself having a public IP address. As long as I have some device on my network that all the devices can communicate with, then I'm able to do this. Because they can just send their request right to my router and not care about my private IP address at all. And CNN.com might not even know that I have a private IP address. So does that process make sense? Great. Oh, question? Sure. sure, so that's a good question. So the question is, do, can I assume that you know, all of my devices will have a private IP address and it could be the same? So the answer is it depends. So some networks have this thing called NAT enabled and some don't. Because for example, in CNN might want to have a bunch of servers uh, on their network, all that have public IPs, where at Harvard, for example, we don't really need that because my iPhone isn't a web server. So it totally depends on the network that you're connected to. And we'll see in just a minute how the network is actually responsible for giving you either a private IP or a public IP. And that's something you'd actually configure on the network when you're setting it up. And also, um, when I go to, like, I'll set up when I go to CNN.com on my Android, it comes back with, like, the, like automatically the mobile version, you know? So you said that, like, CNN doesn't care, you know, what device it's going to. So does that mean the, the router is? Yeah, so that's a great question. So how does CNN, for example, send me back the mobile site? And this actually has something to do with something we're going to get to next week when we talk about HTTP. But basically, when we say that the router doesn't care, we mean that the router doesn't care where it's sending the information. What information is sent is, not, is a decision not made by the router. right? CNN.com is the one who decides, should I send you the mobile or the uh, regular site? So it's actually, when I make a request to CNN.com, included inside of that request is going to be this little string called a user agent that says, I am an iPhone. Just so you know, server. You, know, you might not even care. I just want to let you know that I'm an iPhone. And CNN can then say, hey, you know, because I want to support this like, mobile site, I'm going to ask in every request, I'm going to look inside of the request, the actual contents of it, and say, are you an iPhone? Did you say if you're an iPhone? Because if you are, I'm going to send you like m.cnn.com. So basically, that's something that happens at a higher level um, than just the simple communication that we're talking about now. But that's a great question, and we'll actually see that next week. Yeah? What happens when you move your computer to like, different routers? Does the IP address change? Or what yeah, so that's a great question. So what happens if we move our computer to a different router, and therefore a different network? And the answer, again, is it depends what could happen. So let's actually talk about 
uh, this thing called DHCP next. And this is basically a process where you assign, get assigned an IP address. So the basic idea is, as soon as I connect to a network, the network is going to say, OK, you are, you're, you're connecting. You need an IP address. I'm going to give you one. And so that's where that decision is made. So when you go from, for example, Harvard to home, and you open your laptop up again, your laptop is going to try to connect to the network. And the network is going to say, oh, you're not connected yet. You don't have an IP. I'm going to give you a new one that's on my network. So your IP address could change, or it could be the same, depending on kind of what happens there. But you will always be, go through this process of receiving an IP address when you connect to a network. So for example, if I go to a site uh, like whatismyip.com, I can see what my IP address is. So 140.247.0.35. So is this a public or a private IP address? Public IP address. All right, so that's interesting. But what if I, instead of asking this random website what my IP address is, what if I actually ask my computer what it is? So I'm back at the terminal, and I'm going to type a command that's basically going to tell me what my IP address is. So now I see this thing here, 10.251.74.63. How about this, public or private? private? Private IP address. So what does that mean about the IP address that I see here? Yeah, so now we're using NAT. So this is exactly what's happening. My computer has this private IP address, but this site here, whatismyip.com, has no idea. It just sees a public IP address that it can actually respond to. Make sense? So just a quick digression. Um, so we mentioned before that you know, when, once I, when we were looking at the output of traceroute, we said that, OK, well, you know, I'm going to hit this router, and then that router is going to send along to another router and another router. So how, does the, how do routers know? Where to go, right? If I if I send a request uh, to CNN.com and it hits, you know, maybe a router at Harvard or a router in New Jersey, the router needs to somehow know where to send that request. So inside of a router is this thing called a routing table, and it's not. And every router doesn't know where every other router in the internet is, right? Because that would be just this huge amount of information that's constantly changing, even. So it's not practical for every router to know where everything else is, or else I could probably just, you know, send it directly. So instead, what a router does know is not exactly where CNN.com is, but kind of where CNN.com is. So for example, when we look here, we went from Newark to Washington. So Newark to Washington isn't directly to CNN.com, but this router knew kind of the general direction. So now when we say general direction, I mean if I get an IP address that's greater than this number and less than this number, kind of like in this range, then I'm going to send it this way. If I get another number that's within this other range, I'm going to send it that way. So that means that the, we're not always going to make a great decision, right? The path to uh, Georgia might actually kind of go, you know, kind of in the wrong direction for a little bit, but it's eventually going to get there. And the reason being, it doesn't really matter, you know, if we go a little bit out of the way, because each router doesn't know exactly how to get there. And so that's how we're actually moving requests from router to router. Each router just has this thing called a router routing table. That says generally, OK, you probably need to go in this direction if you're looking for CNN.com. And so that's why um, our request might kind of look in the wrong direction. And as you may see in the problem set, uh, sometimes they will go in the wrong direction across continents, but that's OK. So it gets the job done. OK, so let's now address those questions of how do I get an IP address on a network. So to do that, we're going to use this thing called DHCP. And DHCP uh, is just the name of this process by which I am assigned an IP address on a network. So here's what happens. So I am a computer, and I just connected to this network. And I'm kind of lost and confused, and I don't really know what to do. So I'm kind of like the freshman in college who has no idea where to do. So what does he do? He emails the entire campus list asking where the bathroom is in his dorm. Because he has no idea who to ask, so he's just going to ask everybody. So that computer actually does that. We connect to a network, and I'm going to ask everybody, what do I do? I'm lost. So then uh, we're going to have the nice peer advisor respond, hey, it's OK. I'm the one you need to be talking to if you need an IP address on this network. So this device is going to be called a DHCP server. So again, we have this client-server interaction. My computer is a client, and I need to be served some information by this other machine. So this DHCP server it's just a machine whose job is to give out IP addresses on a network. OK. So my client gets back, and I'm feeling really relieved because someone answered me, and I can, I can get an IP address, and I won't be lost. 
And so then I'm going to say, OK, I, wa I now want an IP address. So I'm going to send a message now, not to everyone. You know, kind of, I didn't hit reply all and be that, that person. I replied just to my server, the DHCP server, rather. So I'm going to say, OK, hi, I'm, I'm client. I need an IP address. And the server is going to say, OK, I'm going to offer you an IP address. The DHCP server says, OK, I'm going to set this IP address aside for you. And I'm going to tell you what it is. And then only when the client says, OK, I got it. This is my IP. Then the DHCP server says, OK, no one else can have that IP address. And you're good to go on the network. So this is kind of the process for getting an IP. It's managed by the network. So as a computer, I can't just randomly say, oh, I want to, I, this is my IP, woohoo. I need to, if I'm using DHCP, I actually ask the network what my IP should be. And so this is the process by which I get assigned. And we call this, this five-step process here DHCP, where the P is for protocol, which we'll take a look at um, much, late, uh, much more next week. But a protocol is just this kind of set of steps that everyone follows. So no matter what kind of device I connect to the internet, it could be a laptop, it could be my iPhone, if it follows this five-step process, then it's going to be able to get on the network because it's kind of following the DHCP rules. And so this, you know, when I connect to a new network, I'll go through this process again and get a new IP address. Could be public, could be private, depends on what this DHCP server responds with. Questions? OK, so that's kind of at a higher level. And we'll kind of look at a uh, lower level uh, next week. So here, this is actually an image uh, from a web comic called XKCD, uh, which is kind of this techie, nerdy uh, comic that's really, really awesome. And what he did was he actually took the time to draw a map of the IP address space. So for example, here, each of these dots represents the first number in an IP address. And then he kind of wrote down what geographic region um, that number has been assigned to. So for example, if we look over here, we can see this, this 18 or 17, I can't see, uh, 18. So every IP address that starts with 18.x.y.z actually belongs to MIT, which is crazy because entire continents have that many IP addresses. As we can see kind of over here, where it's like Africa, you get one of those, and some other countries get one of those. MIT actually has an entire one. Reason being, uh, MIT was really important and pioneering in the actual development of the internet. And so we'll see more of the history behind that later. Um, but this is basically how now different DHCP servers know what IP addresses they can assign. So basically this organization called the IANA, the uh, IANA, Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, sat down and said, OK, we're going to split up this IP address space by geographic region. So this was done a long time ago when the internet was first being developed. We said, you know, North America, you can have all of these valid IPs because we think you're going to need this many. So if we look closely, you can actually see over in the 192 region, kind of in the, the right-hand side, there's this little dot that says private. And that's because we said that this 192.168 is actually a private IP address. So I'll put this uh, image online if you kind of want to peruse it. Um, but basically, this is what we mean uh, when we say that, you know, I get this IP address from a DHCP server, this is how the DHCP server knows kind of what it can assign. It's, it's actually split up by regions like this. And so it's kind of hard to see here, but we'll uh, put this online afterwards so that you can take a look. Okay, so now uh, let's talk about the connection speeds to the internet. So we know that we're connected to the internet via our internet service provider. And that means that the internet service provider is going to be the one that kind of controls how fast you can connect to the internet. So we're actually going to be measuring internet connections in megabits per second, uh, which I apologize on behalf of the entire internet that we do this. Um, but we're no longer talking about megabytes with a capital B. We're now talking about megabits uh, with a lowercase b. And so when you see something like you know, 100 MB MBPS, megabits per second, that's not megabytes per second. It's actually about a factor of 10 less, or 8 to be precise. So here, for example, are a couple of plans. So this top one here uh, is a plan from Comcast, and the bottom one here is a plan from Verizon. So this top one is kind of broadband and cable, and it's actually going to end up being a bit pricier than this bottom one, uh, but that's because the speeds are much faster. So for example, down here, Let's say we get a 3 megabits per second connection. So let's say we get this one here. So let's say, you know, how long is it going to take for me to download a movie? 
So a couple weeks ago, we saw that a movie is about a gigabyte or so. So if we have a gigabyte, then we need to download all of those gigabytes. Then we have a connection that is 3 megabits per second. So that's going to mean it's going to take 45 minutes or so to download. So instead, if we kind of bump it up to a 20 megabits per second, so this plan up here is more expensive, but now we get a faster internet connection. And that means we can download that same movie in about 10 minutes or so. So again, if we double that, uh, we can get even faster and faster speeds. So now when you're kind of, you know, if you're ever renewing your internet connection plan or you want to kind of take a look at it, this is what these numbers actually mean now. So when we say megabits per second, you can now kind of translate that into real world things, right? This number doesn't mean anything. It's not a just meaningless number. It's nice to see that 105 is much bigger than 20. But now you can know what it means in terms of actually downloading things. So that's megabits per second, which again is unfortunately not megabytes per second. So these numbers here, they're all carefully worded usually. And rather than saying you know, 105 megabits per second, it usually says up to 105 megabits per second. So that means that you're not always getting this full, um, this full speed. You're usually getting you know, some fraction of that. There are actually sites available, and you'll do this on the problem set, um, that actually test how fast your internet connection really is, basically by you know, contacting a server and timing how long it took for to get from your computer to that server and doing some magic there. But what your ISPs do frequently do, though, is this thing called bursting. And so rather than always give you 100 megabytes per second, when you start downloading a file, we could say, OK, for the first 10 or 20 megabytes you download, we're going to give you that full throttle connection. So no, we're not lying anymore. So we're going to give you that full connection, but only for about the first 10 or 20 megabytes. So that means that if I'm only downloading small files, my internet's just going to start feeling faster. Right? Because that first 10 megabytes is coming in at this extreme speed, and then after that, it's going to start to slow down. So on larger files, which are less common, unless you download movies like every second of every day, that's going to start to take longer. But as you're commonly browsing the internet, it's going to start to feel faster, because your ISP is bursting your connection temporarily. So that's why these tests on like speedtest.net and the other ones that you'll see might be a little bit inaccurate. Because you don't know what your ISP is actually doing there. It could be bursting your speed. It could be throttling. You don't really know. So this is just kind of like an approximation of how fast your connection is actually, actually is. Um, so it's not perfect, um, but it gives you some idea of what's actually going on behind the scenes. So those connections now all apply to wired networks. But at your home or even at work, you probably don't just have a wired network. Unless you plan on hooking like, your iPhone up to the wired network, you probably have something that's wireless. So at home, you might have a network that's powered by a wireless router made by someone like Linksys or D-Link. Uh, in one of these this week's section videos, we'll actually see the process of setting up a home network and maybe playing around with some settings and setting a password and things like that. But this router probably uses a standard called 802.11n or 802.11g. So what those are are these standards for actually pr uh, providing wireless internet access. And so each of these different standards has a different speed limit associated with it. So 802.11g, for example, was developed kind of a while ago. It's kind of old now. And that had a limit based on the technology of about 54 megabits per second. So that means that no matter how fast your internet connection is coming into your router, the router can only forward along that data at a maximum of 54 megabits per second. And again, this is like a theoretical maximum. So we're probably getting 50 to 60% of that in the real world, actually. So that means that if you have an 802.11g router, you really don't want to go out and spend $100 a month on Comcast's 105 megabit per second plan, because it doesn't matter. You're going to be pumping in 105 megabits into your router, who then kind of slowly forwards them along to your devices. So on the other hand, 802.11n is just a newer standard. If you buy a router today, it's probably that. And that just has a much higher limit of about 300 megabits per second. Uh, other ones might have higher. And that just means that you can now kind of take better advantage of your wired connection speed. So when you're hooking up your home network, that's just something to keep in mind, that it doesn't matter how fast your ISP connection speed is if your wireless router can't take full, full advantage of that. So on the side of the router box, you might see that 802.11g or a or b or n, or now are kind of making new ones. Um, and that just describes basically how fast your router can send information based on how your router is working underneath the hood. 
So you also, we'll see this later, but you also probably want to put a password on your wireless router. Reason being that, as we'll see in section, it's really easy to actually sniff what's going on inside of a network. If everything's just kind of public and all out there, I can actually, without doing anything really, I can just be on that network and kind of watch all the traffic that's going back and forth. So if you type in your bank account number and your password into a website and it's just you know, totally out in the open, I can just kind of see that flow through the interweb, through the interweb and take it, which is not a good thing. So what we can do then is introduce these things uh, called WEP or WPA or WPA2 that are encryption. And we'll see this later when we talk about security and privacy, but encryption basically scrambles the information that's going around your internet so someone can't just kind of look in your window and read it. So the, the way that this works is we we'll basically give some password associated with the network that you might have seen, you know, if you've connected to a network and it asked you for a password, that means that the network is probably using one of these things here, which are just different ways of encrypting information. And only with that password can I actually be able to send information around the network. So that means that without the password, it's not easy for me to see what the actual contents of the information being sent around it is. So we'll talk about that in much more detail later, but these are actually the different ways of encrypting or making your wireless network more secure. So the first of these, WEP, is actually a really bad idea because some smart people figured out how to crack it. So even if they don't have the password in about five minutes, uh, they can do the equivalent of get the password and see everything that's going around the internet. So when you set up your home network, as we'll see in section, it's a really good idea to give it a password so that things aren't just kind of flowing around where everybody can read them. So finally, before we take a break, uh, your phone, for example, might not use 802.11n or 802.11g. It might use this other thing called 3g or 4g. So as the HP video alluded to, there, there's no 5g or 6g, but 4g is really just a newer version of 3g. And again, there are just different speeds uh, associated with these things. So much, they're going to be much lower right now uh, than, for example, 802.11n. This is going to be much slower if you're on a 4G connection um, than if you're on like a home Wi-Fi network. So that's, that's what the 3G and the 4G refers to on your phone. So let's take a five minute break uh, and then we'll come back and we'll take a look at domains in DNS instead of IP addresses. All right, everyone, welcome back. Um, so before we keep going, just a couple logistical points. Um, so in the last problem set, uh, there was some confusion about a form. Um, that was completely my fault and, and overzealous copy-paste. Um, there, there was no form on the last problem set, but there is on this problem set. Um, so now the, the URL uh, is right there in the submission instructions, and it's also in the last question. Uh, and this is just simply an opportunity uh, for you to let us know how we're doing so far in the course. So let us know what you think of lecture, lectures and sections and problem sets. Um, just give us some feedback um, that we're really interested in how to make the course better. Um, so if you have any suggestions of things that we're not doing so well or things we could do better, um, definitely let us know. And we're going to take all this feedback into account uh, as we move forward with the problem sets and lectures. Um, so please do fill this out uh, to the best of your ability. That would really, really help us out uh, in planning the course. Um, so this is actually a courtesy RJ, uh, but I just wanted to run a trace route now uh, to this IP here and just see what it happens to output. Um, so we're going to actually hang on this server, on this router here, until let me let me make let me get, make this a little more cinematic. So if we scroll down to all the routers that we've hit so far, turns out you can name routers whatever you want, and so we can actually get the introduction to Star Wars uh, if you're not familiar. So if you're really bored and want to impress your friends, if you run a trace route to that completely random IP address on the internet. Someone took the time to set up these like pseudo routers and actual routers and named them according to the introduction to Star Wars. So trace route's really fun. OK. So just a couple other um, terms that you may have heard uh, while you're browsing your home internet or particularly your, your work internet, maybe. So the first is this thing called a firewall. So does anyone happen to know what a firewall is or because they've been frustrated by a firewall, perhaps? Yeah, so it blocks connections. So what a firewall does is it says, all right, according to this set of rules, when a request comes in to a computer, I can either let it go through or I can block it. So that means that this, the person who set up your network, who you might hate as a result of this, um, could say something like, whenever a request comes in from facebook.com, just block it. Whenever a request comes in from this IP address, you can just block it. 
And so I remember um, back when, when Facebook first come, came out, I happened to be on a network where they, they only blocked Facebook.com. So what you could do is you could actually type in something like hs.facebook.com for high school or harvard.facebook.com, and it would go through the firewall because they had only blocked Facebook.com. So other firewalls are susceptible to, rather than typing Facebook.com, if I type the IP address of Facebook.com, we're OK, because the network administrator only blocked Facebook.com, not the IP address. Um, so that's basically what a firewall is. It's kind of this layer that is between you and the internet. So when I say you now, we're talking about the router, because you're just connected to the router. And so the firewall is standing between the router and the rest of the internet. And it basically comes in, every request that comes in, the firewall is going to examine it. It's going to say, OK, you know, does the, do the, are the contents of this request OK? Is the, where it's coming from OK? And if it is, I'm going to let it through. If not, I'm going to block it. So in addition to just pre pre preventing you from procrastinating at work, um, this could actually be a nice security thing in case someone did something like was accidentally running a web server on their computer or other security holes like that. If one person uh, has a security hole in their computer, then someone could come in and kind of compromise the entire network. Um, and so that's no good. And so this is kind of an additional layer of security that kind of prevents one person from kind of doing something that we don't want the entire network to do. So it's kind of a network level defense. Um, so, another, so this is kind of what a firewall looks like. If that WAN is kind of the wide area network that represents the rest of the internet, then there's a firewall between where I'm connected, my local area network. And so there's kind of a router inside of that brick wall. So you may have also heard this term VPN, uh, which stands for a virtual private network. And all a VPN does is it basically allows you to access a LAN without being connected to it. So the idea is that you know, when you're connected to a LAN, and that could be a private network, which means that it's not accessible to anyone else on the internet, you can basically put some maybe you know, secret documents there that you don't want anyone else to see. But then if you want to work from home and you kind of need one of those secret documents, there's no way of getting onto the LAN and so without actually being physically connected to it. And so this VPN thing basically allows you to connect to a LAN securely. So all of your information is encrypted, which means nobody can read it. And so all this does is it allows you to connect to the LAN and kind of pretend like you're on that network, even if you're actually going through a publicly and ins insecure network. And so that's all we mean when, we s when you hear the term VPN. OK. So, so far, we've only seen these IP addresses. And things like CNN.com have just been kind of tangential. So what is CNN.com? So this is something called a domain. And a domain, really, is basically an alias for an IP address. Right? When we wanted to get our daily news, we don't want to have to go to our address bar and type in like 157.26.whatever. You know, we want to somehow type in something that's easy to remember, easy to type, and that's not a series of uh, four digits. So domains are simply a way of kind of abstracting away this concept of an IP address. So when you connect to something, you, know, you don't care what IP address it is. You only care about this nice human readable identifier for it. And so this, this system that allows us to map these things called domains to these IP addresses is called DNS, or Domain Name System. And basically, all DNS does is a way of us, for us to say, if my browser is going to CNN.com, my browser needs to know what IP address CNN.com corresponds to. So all DNS is is this way of going from a domain to an IP address. So typically, when I go to CNN.com, the first thing that I'm going to do is figure out what IP address CNN.com is. Because I can't simply make a request to CNN.com. As we saw, I make requests to IP addresses, because IP addresses is what identifies computers on a network. So with DNS, I can kind of translate from this nice thing I can remember to this actually unique identifier for a computer on a network or on the internet. And it was basically like this big phone book of things. So when the internet first started out, um, this phone book of domain, name system, domain names was in this one file called hosts.txt, or .txt. And basically, whenever someone connected to the internet, they, ha they had to copy this file called hosts.txt and put it on their machine. And so that meant that whatever was defined in this side of this text file, that were basically all of the domains that existed on the internet. So that doesn't really scale anymore, right? Because we'll have you know, tens of millions of copies of this host.txt you know, kind of floating around on the internet. But it does still exist on your computer. So if I'm on a Mac, uh, this file happens to be located in a folder called Etsy, so slash Etsy. And the file is just called hosts. So if I open it up, after typing in my password, if I open it up, my host file looks something like this. 
And so what I've done here is I've actually put a new entry. So what I'm saying is bing.com, actually I want you to map to this IP address. So if this were kind of the, the beginning days of the internet, that host.txt file that was distributed, it looked just like this. And there was a row for every domain. And so in this row, we're saying bing.com is this IP address. So that means that when I open up my laptop here and I go to bing.com, you know, if this is the only source of DNS, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go through this file line by line and look for bing.com. And it's going to find it. It's going to say, OK, bing.com is that IP address. So now, if I open up a new browser, and I promise there are no tricks here, and I go to bing.com, I actually just went to Google. Because I typed in this Etsy hosts file, this host.txt. I told my computer that bing.com was actually an IP address that belongs to Google. And so this is how, in the early internet, how the domain names were actually resolved. We looked in this single phone book, and we said, OK, if I just see a string, bing.com, this just random sequence of characters, I just need to know what IP address that is. So because inside of my host.txt file, I said, bing, whenever you see bing.com, that means you're at the IP address 74.whatever. So when I make a request to bing.com with this thing defined, that means that my web browser is going to go to this IP address, which is Google. So if I actually get rid of that line, so I got rid of that line. And I'll just clear my browser cache. Now if I go back to bing.com, all is right in the world again. The reason being is I just removed that line. I told my computer, never mind, bing.com is no longer the IP address 74.whatever. And so now it's going to use the DNS system that we're about to take a look at. So the DNS system is basically, rather than storing all of the domain names and IP addresses that correspond to them in this one big file that we kind of distribute everywhere, we're going to make this big, huge distributed database of domain names. So there's not going to be one file, but there's going to be a bunch of different servers all around the world responsible for keeping track of where the domain names are mapped to. So what IP address corresponds to each of these domain names. So each of these machines is going to be called a DNS server. And a DNS server is basically just going to maintain you know, some subset or some list, not every domain in the internet, but some you know, list of some domains on the internet and record what IP address they actually correspond to. So there are a few different types of DNS servers. So the first that we're going to look at is this thing called a root DNS server. And the root DNS servers are kind of the authoritative source of information. So the root the, it, we have to start somewhere, right? So the root DNS server is kind of going to be where we start. So this is where all of the information is originally stored. And what's stored in each of these DNS servers is not kind of a list of a bunch of domains, but actually a list of other servers that have the domains. So right now there are 13 um, different groups of DNS servers around the world. So there, there aren't, uh, as literature may suggest, there are not just 13 root DNS servers. Uh, if you go to rootservers.org, these are basically where all of the different root servers are located. So there are 13 groups of root DNS servers, but as you can see, they're kind of scattered all around the world. And the reason that we have so many of them is one, because if something were ever happened, if something were ever compromised with one DNS server, someone kind of erased a root DNS server, for example, and we didn't ha get it, this is kind of the original source of information. If we delete it, we suddenly don't know where all of these domains point to. So we have to have many for that problem for that reason, and also because we don't want tens of millions of people connecting to the same server at once, right? Because that single root DNS server would get overloaded, and it's just totally not realistic to have 13 servers powering the entire world. Um, so instead, we have all of these different uh, root DNS servers that you can connect to, and each of these servers stores some information about domain names. So as I said, it doesn't actually stir, store these mappings from domain names to IP addresses. Instead, they're going to store mappings between domain names and some other servers. And those other servers are called TLD DNS servers. And these TLD DNS servers basically take charge of a, give, of a certain TLD. So TLD stands for top level domain. And when you go to something like CNN.com or CSE1.net, that .com or .net is what's called a TLD. So any domain on the internet has to end in one of these valid TLDs. So we can basically split up where all of the information is stored 
based on these TLDs. So I have this server over here handles all the .coms, this server, here, server over here handles all the .nets. So the root DNS server stores locations to these things. So these things, unfortunately, don't store the answer either, but they store the location of a server that actually does this time. So these servers are called the authoritative name servers, and these things are basically managed by companies like GoDaddy or other hosting uh, places that can allow you to actually host a website or buy a domain. And these were, are what you actually interact with when you, for example, buy a domain. So let's take a look at an example of resolving a DNS request. So we typed in cnn.com into our web browser. We just saw there are all these different types of DNS servers that somehow interact. So let's see what actually happens. So as we saw before, I typed in bing.com. So the first thing my browser did was it looked inside of this hosts.txt file. And if that hosts.txt file gave me an answer, then we're done. So the first time I did it, that file did give me an answer. It said bing.com, 74 dot something, we're done. But we saw that file, it didn't really have anything else. So for every other request I make, that file is not going to give me an answer. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start asking DNS servers now. Because my computer doesn't know where it is, so I need to figure it out. So the first thing I'm going to ask is a question to this DNS, cache DNS server. These things happen to be managed by you know, your ISPs. And so if you have a bunch of people connected to Comcast and they're all asking for Facebook.com, it'd be really nice if we can just give them an immediate answer for Facebook.com. We don't have to worry about these root servers or DNS ser TLD DNS servers, whatever. Um, so these cache DNS servers are just these things maintained by Comcast that say, OK, well, if we had a bunch of requests for Facebook, we're just going to temporarily remember where Facebook.com is so we can just give people answers faster. So much like um, in lecture two, when we talked about the L1 cache and the L2 cache, uh, it's just kind of a place to store temporary information that we need to access again and again and again. This is exactly what these cache DNS servers are. We're getting requests for the same thing over and over and over again. So let's just remember the answer temporarily. So again, these things aren't necessary for your DNS to function. So if the cache DNS server doesn't have my answer either, that's when I need to start going through each of these different servers. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ask a root DNS server, hey, I need the IP address for this domain. The root DNS server is going to say, OK, great, you're looking for cnn.com. I'm going to point you in the direction of the correct TLD server. And again, there aren't just one TLD server for, for all the .coms, all the .nets. There are a bunch of these things. And that's why we kind of need the root DNS server to tell us which one to go to. Right? We're going to rent, we're going to basically connect to whatever root DNS server our ISP tells us to. And that could be based on things like, you know, we don't want to send 100 people to this one, then 100 people to this one. We kind of want to distribute, kind of like the parallelism we talked about. So we basically connect to one of these root DNS servers. And then the root DNS server is going to send us to one of these TLD DNS servers. TLD DNS server is going to say, OK, you're looking for CNN.com. I know who knows that answer. It's going to be the authoritative name server who's going to respond back, yep, cnn.com is 157.226.something.something. And so then the answer is going to kind of propagate back to my web browser. The author so the authoritative name server is going to tell the TLD server, it's going to tell the root server, it's going to tell the cache server, maybe, which is going to tell me. So basically, through this hierarchical process, that is how we go from a domain to an IP address. And so there's actually a really cool website that actually traces this process for you. So for example, I just typed into this little text box here, I want to trace how I figured out what IP address cnn.com corresponds to. So I click Trace, and I'm going to get this. So what happened is, here are the IP addresses of all of these root servers. So my request first went to a root server, just because this site isn't bothering with host files or cache server servers or anything. So we go directly to a root server. And the root server says, OK, I connected to this one, which has this IP address. And so I'm going to get a response. I said, OK, I'm looking for cnn.com. So I'm going to send you to a TLD server corresponding to .com. So here we go. We have all of these TLD servers now. And the TLD server is going to send me to this. So we said before that name servers are probably managed by the company that you're using to host your website, so where the actual server that your website is sitting on. So that means that Time Warner, for example, means that CNN is using uh, somehow Time Warner, and they know where the actual IP address 
to CNN.com is. So that's how I kind of went through this hierarchy. The root TLD server, root server sent me to the TLD server, sent me to Time Warner, who sent me an actual answer. Yeah? Yeah, so, that cho so how is that choice made um, each step of the way? So as you said, it's probably based on some mechanism that doesn't overload any single one. So for example, if, you know, if we just choose one randomly, that would mean that, OK, well, that means that there aren't too many on A, because it's an equal chance of going on A than it is getting on B. Right? If we just flip a coin to go from A or B, then half the time we're going to go to A, half the time we're going to go to B. So there could be more sophisticated things going on under the hood. But the basic idea is that we don't want to overload any single one of these, or else it's just going to slow down. And so that's how these decisions are made, probably some degree of randomness, or at least keeping track of where things have been going. OK, so that's how we uh, look up a domain name. So sometimes we will type in a domain name that doesn't actually correspond to an IP address. For example, in this, in this example, someone typed in something.orgz. And .orgz is not a valid TLD, which means that this domain is not valid at all. So if I, on the Harvard network, type that in, so something.comz, it's going to Google it for me. There we go. So I get a page that looks like this. It says Google Chrome could not find this, and it gives me a nice suggestion. So on the other hand, if, you're, if maybe you're using Comcast or another ISP, you'll get something instead that looks like this. So Google Chrome actually thinks it found this page, because it got some response, and now it's displaying it. So why would Comcast want to do this? I'll give you a hint. What does that? Yeah, so these are now ads at the top. So you made a typo in your address bar. And now that means Comcast seizes this opportunity to send you advertisements. So that means that these, pay these people here paid either Google or Yahoo or Comcast or somebody to have the privilege of being displayed in your web browser when you make a typo in the address bar. So really, this isn't, this isn't really that great, right? I mean, the the we, we want to know whether or not we made a successful connection or not. Here, we, we're trying to access something that doesn't exist at all. And yet, here we go. We get this perfectly valid web page that we can interact with. And so some people would say that Comcast shouldn't really be doing things like this, um, where other people might not be so upset. And so this um, gives rise to this larger debate, uh, which we can talk about at the very end, called net neutrality. But the basic idea behind net neutrality is it's talking about what degree an ISP can exert over your internet connection. So for example, uh, right now, when you, connect, when you buy a Comcast plan, you just buy a plan and you connect to the internet. That's it. Anything on the internet you're allowed to connect to. So what could exist is something like this. So rather than paying a flat fee to connect to the entire internet, what if you instead paid maybe a lower fee? And then if you wanted to access news, well, that's an extra $5 a month. If you want to access sports, that's another $5 a month. And so this is something that comes into the debate of net neutrality. The question is, should something like this be allowed? Right? Do, the I, do ISPs have the authority and have the right to kind of tell you what parts of the internet you can and you cannot access? So you're kind of, you know, maybe you're, you're paying a lower price because, you know, what if I don't care about Netflix and, ES, Netflix and Hulu because, you know, I don't, I don't have those services. So I might end up paying less. But then there's the larger question of, well, do ISPs really have the right to do this, right? Because then suddenly, you know, your, your internet connection is now kind of under the jurisdiction of Comcast. And if they decide that this site here is worth $10 a month and your site's only worth a dollar a month, then suddenly that's going to make it influence whether or not you use Google or Bing, maybe. Yeah? That means basically that the lower price you pay, Comcast will say, they want you, of course, to pay the higher price. But the lower price you pay, the more ads. Yeah, so, so there's another good example. So for example, what if? you paid a lower price but got ads. And so that's also something that could relate to net neutrality. Exactly. So this is totally fictional. This is just someone that uh, on Reddit made up. Um, so this is totally fictional. And another model could be, well, what if Comcast decides that somehow you get advertisements, no matter where you go on the internet? Comcast will send you advertisements for a lower price. So this is another one of these larger issues of net neutrality. 
you know, some people think, yeah, whatever, they're just advertisements. And other people say, no, this is my freedom to access the internet. You, you can't do that to me. So actually, we can have a discussion about this um, afterwards, if we still have time. Um, this is actually a really interesting question. And right now, there are a lot of bills that have been floating around you know, uh, the House of Rep and the, and the Senate recently that relate to exactly this issue. So when you hear net neutrality, maybe on CNN and, and Wolf Blitzer is going on and on about it, this is what we mean. Just can your ISP kind of dictate which parts of the internet you can and can't access? And different people, whether you're an internet user or you own a business on the internet, might have very different opinions about whether or not this should be the case. So we'll come back to that. But I also just wanted to take a quick tangent, because uh, this was one of the coolest articles ever. So the headline really says it all. Uh, in order of seven global cyber guardians now hold keys to the internet. And this sounds totally fictional. Um, but this has to do with the DNS system we were talking about. So we're actually starting to introduce this thing called DNSSEC, or DNS security. It's kind of this additional layer on top of this additional security layer on top of DNS. Um, that ensures that an attacker can't, for example, compromise some DNS servers and start changing results. So that if you try to go, go to google.com, you instead get sent to a site that'll give you a virus or something. So this is kind of this layer of security um, that, according to this article, basically lets these seven people who are in like the US and Burkina Faso and UK and like all over the world, if they all come together like the, the Wonder Twins or the Avengers or something, then they can actually like reset the internet and kind of cleanse it from all of these crazy attacks. And so this was just a really cool article uh, that was on Popular Science a couple of years ago. And this might be you know, an art type of the art a type of article you look at when you're doing, discussing your current events uh, on Discuss. So this kind of article would be really cool uh, for this week. So I just really love that idea that this actually exists. OK, uh, so now let's talk about how we actually configure DNS. So in order for the, D the IP address, 156 dot something, to map, to CNN.com. Someone had to somehow set that up. And we need to somehow figure out how DNS servers know what answer to return. So to do that, we have a number of different types of DNS records. So basically, inside of the DNS server is this big database of information, or basically a big Excel spreadsheet with these rows. And each of these rows can have a different type. So this, for example, is actually what the DNS uh, for CSE1.net looks like. So here at the top, or at the bottom, sorry, we have this. So this IP address here says that this is the IP address for www.cse1.net. So that means that I had to buy that domain, cse1.net, and we'll see in section how you can actually buy that domain. And now I also had to rent some web server. So I said before that I'm just renting this web server from this nice company in New Jersey that charges me $20 a month to put my stuff there. And so now, once I have this web server, this web server has an IP address, because that company made sure that my server had its own IP address and other people could access it on the internet. So now I also bought this domain. That means I control it, I can do whatever I want to it. So now I basically said in this panel here, I want to set my domain to point to this IP address, because I know that this is the IP address of my server. So the panel actually looks something like this, so I can zoom in. So here is simply a row that says www.cse1.net. I want you to go to this IP address here. So there are also some other types of records that DNS can store. If we flip back, so that we just looked at what's called an A record. And an A record, or an AAAA, really original uh, for IPv6 addresses, is something that just maps a domain to an IP address. So this is kind of the most basic thing you can do with DNS. But we also have some different things. Uh, for example, a C name. In a C name, rather than mapping a domain to an IP address, it kind of maps a domain to another domain. So this is kind of a, a, an alias, you could say. So for example, if I flip back to here, we can see here that cdn.cse1.net is actually just an alias for cdn.computerscience1.net, which is just another domain name, and it's hosted somewhere else. So because I've created this entry in DNS, when someone requests what's the IP address for cdn.cse1.net, my DNS server is going to say, I don't know, but it's just the IP address for cdn.computerscience1.net. So this is just some kind of handy way for, to create aliases. For example, if I go to mail.cse1.net, that's just aliased to Google's Gmail. So this is, they told me if you want to use this, then just 
create this C name record that aliases mail.csk1.net to a domain that I can use Gmail on. So those are the two major ones. Uh, but some other types of DNS records are MX, which has to do with email. So we'll look at email closely next week and how that all works. Um, but when I receive an email to staff at cse1.net, something has to happen. It needs to be sent somewhere so my message can be delivered. And, M excuse me, and MX records are kind of what makes that happen. And finally, um, this top one here, this name server, is basically how I told some root uh, so TLD domain server where to look. So somehow I needed to say, well, if I have this .NET and you need to look for some other server that's going to respond, this is how I told a, a, DN a TLD DNS server to come look at my DNS server, which happens to be, for CSE1.NET, this thing here, ns1.linode.com. So this is some DNS server managed by Linode, which is just the company I'm renting my server from. And this is where this file is actually stored. So all of my DNS information is stored on this server here. And when I look, and when a TLD server needs to look for CSE1.NET, it's going to say, OK, I'm, I'm the server for .NET, and I have an entry that tells me to go here when I'm looking for CSE1.NET. And so that's kind of how we set up that communication. So we, that, that hierarchy exists, and this is how I kind of get into that hierarchy. I can't really modify a root DNS server. Um, but the root DNS server is just going to delegate to the TLD. And this is what tells the TLD DNS server, hey, I know where CSE1.net is. Pick me. Any questions? OK. So just briefly, uh, let's talk about TLDs. So we said before that these are kind of the, the dot .coms and the dot .nets of your domain. And so here are a few common ones. So originally, when we first set up the internet, um, we had this grand idea that, oh, anything that ends in .com that's going to be commercial, and anything that ends in .net is going to be a, a network, you know, whatever that means. And, and you know, now we just kind of degraded, you know, I can buy kind of whatever I want and make it whatever I want. Like CSE1.net is not a network. I don't even know what that would mean. Um, but some of these are still restricted. For example, I can't go and buy a .mil, uh, which is reserved for the US military. Similarly, I can't go out and buy a .gov. Uh, which is for the US government. Uh, what I could do, though, is instead of buying whitehouse.gov, if I bought, for example, whitehouse.com, uh, which somebody did a few years ago and kind of set up this really malicious site. So anyone looking for the White House just assumed it'd be whitehouse.com. Uh, so the system kind of has fallen apart now. You can kind of just buy whatever domain you want and host whatever you want there. So prime example of this are these things called CCTLDs, or country code top-level domains. So basically, any country now uh, has its own TLD. And we've delegated control of that TLD to the country, to the country that owns it. So for example, that .co.uk is managed by the UK. And the UK decides what happens with those domains. So it's not up to the US who can buy a UK domain. It's up to some organization in the UK. So again, uh, that's just kind of like you know, a, a nice vision, but we've kind of done this. We've kind of used these country codes, uh, because there are so many of them, to create these cute words. So for example, uh, the country code for Montenegro is .me, uh, which is you, uh, Apple has this. Uh, and now this, this other site is about.me, which is just kind of like a cute sounding domain. Uh, but they're totally abusing uh, these country codes. Uh, there's also one of my favorites. This is kind of shut down. Uh, Yahoo bought them. Uh, but del.seo.delicious, basically, uh, taking advantage of the .us TLD. My favorite CCTLD being this last one here, uh, .tm, because it's my initials. And so I can have a fun TLD that's just for me. So recently, um, there is this startup company, this, this kind of small business, um, that was using their, their site name was art.sy. So it reads as artsy. But any guess as to what TL, cctld.sy belongs to? Syria. So there's some things happened in Syria recently uh, that weren't so great. And as a result, the site actually lost control of their domain, because like internet access was shut off. And so people couldn't access their site because Syria was in charge of art.sy. And if you actually read the article, uh, these people did something ridiculous. Like they delegated like power of attorney to like a Syrian lawyer. And like they jumped through all of these crazy hoops. That was a terrible idea just to get art.sy. And so if you, for example, you see you know, these sites floating around like bit.ly, um, there's not just anything that can be at the end of these domains, but there's a good chance 
um, that if it's kind of cutesy, it's actually a CC TLD, which means that someone actually had to go through the Libyan government in order to get it, which is, is a lot of work for maybe not a whole lot of return. Um, but if you really want that URL, then go for it. So in addition uh, to these CC TLDs, there's actually a movement going on now um, that will allow people to petition to register their own TLD. And so here's this massive list of basically all of the uh, pending ones. So you know, for example, Acer Computer wants to register something.acer. So if you went to something like laptops.acer, that would actually be a valid domain name, and it would probably sell you some Acer laptops. Any guesses as to how much it costs to even apply for this? So the domain, just to put it in context, the domain name costs about 10 to 15 bucks a year. How much do you think it costs to apply for one of these? 100 million? 100,000? Other guesses? <laughs> RJ says 799. <laughs> it's actually about $185,000 uh, to apply for one of these. So that means that all of these people, all 56 times, oh, there you go, almost 2,000 people have paid almost $200,000 just to apply. And now this organization called ICANN, uh, which is basically an internet governance body that kind of keeps track of uh, how we're handing out these various domain names, they get to either approve or deny you. So you could have just wasted $200,000 uh, to try to register something.airbus, which is really useful for like two domains. <laughs> so the people who actually give you these domains are called registrars. Um, so if you watch the Super Bowl, there is a certain commercial that uh, got a certain amount of attention uh, by a registrar called GoDaddy. And unfortunately, GoDaddy is a fantastic service uh, who has interesting marketing choices. Um, but what GoDaddy does is it's their responsibility for interfacing with this organization called ICANN that kind of governs when we're handing out um, these domain names. And so GoDaddy, there's also uh, Network Solutions, which is one of the very early people in the internet, uh, and Namecheap. And all they do is they kind of file the paperwork to get you your domain name. And you pay them some amount of money um, to basically manage all of that for you. So once you have a domain name, uh, like cse1.net, then you can start using your server's DNS to configure where that domain name goes. And so you get that domain name, as we'll see in section, from what's called a registrar. OK, so let's shift gears a little bit. And rather than just talk about domains, let's talk about the rest of this thing called a URL. So a URL uh, just stands for a Uniform Resource Locator. And as you might have guessed, a URL is just some way of identifying something on the internet. And so we call that something a resource. So a resource could be something like cse1.net. There's some content there, and you get some, something back when you request cse1.net. But then you could also have a URL like cse1.net slash psets slash pset3. And it looks like this is just some way of identifying now a PDF document. So it just so happens that this is actually the folder structure that I have on my actual machine. So if I navigate to this directory, so this is basically um, all of the files that are located on cse1.net. And I actually have in here a folder called psets. And if I go into that folder called psets, this is where the actual documents are sitting. So we can see that my URL, which remember was just slash psets slash pset3, was kind of like a folder and file thing, right? I have a folder called psets slash a file called pset3.pdf. So we call this, PC, this PDF file a resource. And this is a way of locating this resource on the internet, because this URL is unique. There can only be one thing at this URL. So that's how we can actually get it with this unique locator. So the, this is an example a URL that has all of the possible things a URL can contain. And so hopefully you don't ever actually access a URL that looks like this. So the first part here is called the scheme. And this is going to tell the server how you're going to be communicating. So this thing called HTTP is basically a standard for two computers on the internet to communicate back and forth. It's basically a format for messages. So if I, I have a request to a server, I'm going to basically fill in a form and make, the same, make a request in the same format as everybody else. So kind of a standardized protocol for clients and servers communicating. We'll take a much closer look at HTTP in particular. But for now, uh, next week, 
Um, but for now, just know that this is kind of the way information will be transferred back and forth. And pretty much any time you go to a web page, there's a really good chance you'll be using HTTP or HTTPS. So next, uh, we have some authentication. Um, so HTTP has built in um, this way of kind of password protecting resources on a server. So the server can say, unless you have this username and password, you're just not allowed um, to access this file or this other resource. So you can actually build that right into the URL. So rather than going to this page and getting a little pop-up and typing in your username and password, some sites will allow you to just kind of put it in the URL. It will kind of do the equivalent of auto-completing the username and password for you. So why might this not be the best way to log into Facebook? If Facebook supported this, which I don't think they do. Why might, why might a site not want to allow this? Yeah, so your password's right there. So if anyone's kind of looking over your shoulder as you're browsing Facebook, not only do they see you know, all, the embarrassing, all your embarrassing photos, they also see your password, which is potentially more embarrassing. So next, we now have the domain name, and this is what we've seen before. So example.com is this domain, and this foo.example.com is what's called a subdomain. So we saw before when we had mail.cse1.net or cdn.cse1.net that these are basically dividing this domain name even further. So it can have any number of subdomains. And each of these subdomains can map to a different IP. So next, we have something called the port. And we'll, basic, we'll take a look at this uh, a little bit later next week. But basically, a port is a way, for example, for someone to run two web servers on the same machine. So if I wanted to have one web server powering this website and another completely different type of web server powering another site, I can use ports to do that. Basically, when we talk about HTTP and these other protocols, each of them has a port associated with them. So usually, uh, you don't even see this inside of the URL because the browser assumes that if, they doesn't, if it doesn't see one, it's going to use the port number 80, which is something that's just been defined. And we'll see all of that later. So don't worry too much about the port and the scheme right now. But next, we have this thing called the path. And we saw before that on cse1.net, when you get that PSET2 PDF, this path is basically corresponds to where that server is sitting, where that file is sitting on my server. Next, we have something called the query string. And the query string is how we can pass information to a web page. So for example, if you're on the lectures page of e1.net and you click this, the URL you're going to get is this URL here. We see slash video question mark, v equals lectures1, lecture1. And so this is a way of basically passing some information to the web page. So I'm saying, what video do I want? Well, I want the lectures1, lecture1 video. So now let's look at the path of this URL, though. So the path here is just slash video. And I don't actually have a file called video sitting on my web server. So while sometimes the path could actually correspond to a file on disk, it doesn't have to. So you can't assume for example, um, that something in a path is actually a file that's sitting there on disk. But a lot of times it can be. And finally, this thing here is called the fragment. And this is just some other way of storing information in the URL. Usually, this is used by the client, where the query string is used by the server. So those are just names for the different parts of the URL. So the query string, uh, the term for that way the query string is formatted, is called key value pairs. And the idea behind a key value pair is that you'll have something that looks like this at the top. So my key here, we're calling query. This could be something I'm passing to Google, maybe. And this is a way of just a standardized format for transferring information from my client to the server. So right here, I'm going to send two keys. I'm going to send a value for the key query. I'm looking for a CSE1. And I'm going to send a page number. So I'm looking for the page three. So this is just some way of having my client transfer some information to the server. And the server can do whatever it wants with that information. So the server could say, well, I'm getting requests from a client, but that client needed to tell me what page number they want. And they could have put that page number in the URL. So I can say, rather than kind of you know, looking through and trying to figure it out, I can just say, what is the value for the key page? So we'll see this more next week. But when we say key value pairs, it's just a standardized way of encoding some information. We'll see different types of encoding information. And this is just one of them. So we run into some problems if we want to send a value that looks like this, because it turns out that that ampersand means something, and that question mark means something. Question mark, for example, means that here comes a query string. So we can't just put a question mark in the URL. So we have to do is use this thing 
called URL encoding, which basically is much like ASCII, just a mapping. So we have this mapping from a question mark to this other character. So here's a list of some URL encoding things. So if you ever see, for example, and there was a comment on. So if you see, for example, in a URL, percent to b, that just means that we're actually encoding a plus. So just like in binary, we encoded a capital A with the number 65. Here, we're just arbitrarily encoding a plus with a percent to b. Just because we can't just put whatever we want in a URL because things like the colon and the question mark actually mean things. So that's a URL. You may also have heard the word URI. Um, so these actually aren't the same thing, although they're kind of commonly conflated. The difference being a URI is simply a way of identifying something, where a URL is a way of locating something. So for example, if I have something like 33 Oxford Street, that's a way of locating a building. But it's also kind of a way of identifying that building, right? Because there's no other building at 33 Oxford Street. So when I say 33 Oxford Street, that means that, OK, that's, that's the building I'm talking about. On the other hand, something like an ISBN. An ISBN is a way of uniquely, locating, of uniquely identifying a book. But looking at this ISBN, I don't know where to buy it. Right? Like I, I know that this ISBN happens to identify one of the best books ever, Alice in Wonderland, but it doesn't tell me where I can go to Barnes & Noble and pick it up. So we would call this a URI, where a URL would kind of describe a location. So that's just kind of abstract, um, but a lot of people would just kind of use URI and URL interchangeably because maybe URI just like sounds cooler than URL, but they actually have this subtle difference, where a URL is for locating, URI is for identifying. So URLs can also be URIs, but not every URI, like this ISBN, is a URL. So that's just kind of what those words mean. So we said before um, that this thing here corresponded to an actual file on disk, but a lot of times URLs won't do that. So to close here, we're going to talk briefly about this thing called an API, which is another buzzword that you may have heard. And an API is basically a way that a company can make its information available to other people. So for example, a really cool API is this one here. So the MBTA actually makes available all the positions of all of the trains. So for example, this is the red line. And if I look at this URL here, it looks like I have slash lib slash something slash red dot json. So their API says, if you go to this URL, you're going to get back some information about the red line. This information just happens to be encoded using this thing called JSON. But you can see here that we kind of have key value pairs. We have a key stop, alewife, we have a key seconds, 810. And that could mean, well, it's about 810 seconds until a train gets to alewife, which isn't realistic because trains are not that fast, at the MBTA at least. So this is kind of a way of encoding information so Facebook also might have an API. This is basically just a way for Facebook to share information with people who use it. So rather than going to my Facebook profile to get some information, if I actually just go to this URL here, um, api.facebook.com slash me, I'm going to get some information from my Facebook profile. Like there's my Facebook ID, and there's my first name. So this API is a way for Facebook to expose information to other people. So that kind of exposes information on your profile, but your profile has a lot of other stuff. So it, instead, an API is just this set of URLs that someone writes. Facebook said, by the way, if you go to slash me, you're going to get this information. And this API is just a way for companies to expose their information to other people. So that's all that really uh, commonly, word, commonly used term means, just some company making its information available to other people, this kind of standardized and easier to use format. So we'll take a look at that next week, but just kind of a summary of everything we saw today. Um, so the first half, we looked at networking. And so we know what routers are and what an IP address is, and the difference between a WAN and a LAN. And then uh, we kind of focused on the domain name system, on uh, things like how a domain name is actually resolved, what a URL means, uh, and other stuff like that. So I'll hang around here uh, afterwards for questions. Um, but if not, see you next week.